Vice Chancellor, uh, uh, Deputy Chair of Council, and all the other dignitaries here. I don't know you all. I don't even know your titles. But I want to tell you, in 1955, when I got my bachelor degree in this very hall, I didn't get a hug from a gorgeous woman, a chancellor. <laughs> what a change in South Africa, that a woman can be vice-chancellor of a university. <laughs> and dare I whisper, a black woman at that? They tell me nothing has changed in South Africa since 1994. And I want to tell you, I'm not very diplomatic. That's a load of cobblers. Lots has changed. When I look at this hall today and compare it to when I got my bachelor degree in 1955, there was a sea of white faces. There wasn't South Africa here. And today, South Africa is here on the platform, down there, getting degrees. <laughs> and I want to say that my comrades and I, Rivonia Trial and tens of thousands of others, we did something, you know. We changed the country. We really have changed the country and made it possible for new things to happen. None of us did it on our own. And there is a narrative, you know, that Nelson Mandela, great leader that he was, and it was such an honor to serve with him and to be inspired by him, didn't bring freedom on his own. The story is Nelson Mandela sat in prison and he whispered some nice words to President de Klerk. He said, OK, I'll open the doors and you can be free. That too is a load of nonsense, you know. The real leader, and Nelson Mandela honors it, uh, acknowledges it himself, was the ANC in exile led by the great O.R. Tambo. And when you ask young people today, do you know the name O.R. Tambo? They'll think and think and say, isn't there an airport named after him? <laughs> but who he is is another question. And that's rather sad, because the true greatness is that through his leadership with his comrades, we were able to inspire the mass of people of South Africa. They weren't all members of the ANC, but what the ANC was proclaiming, a non-racial South Africa, a South Africa where all who lived in it would have equal rights in the Freedom Charter. And out of that emerged the United Democratic Front, with something like two million members. It's a mass of people who brings freedom. Why do I talk about it now? Why this old history? Because we're in trouble in our country today. I want to tell you, I have a comrade, Alvy Sachs, renowned judge. We were at university together, but we've known each other for well over 70 years when we both wore short pants he was a head taller than me. He was much more of an activist than I was. And he was called upon by the late O.R. Tambo in exile to begin to put together the ideas of a new constitution, to turn the Freedom Charter into a constitution. He didn't do it on his own. He began to work with Oliver, as we know him, to put the framework together and to recruit people, many of them, South Africans, experts in constitutional development, and people from around the world. But when we were free, and there was the need to appoint judges to the Constitutional Court, Albie Sachs was, of course, named for this. He'd been, after all, instrumental in drawing up our remarkable Constitution. And there were lawyers who had carefully upheld every aspect of apartheid legislation who made Albie run the gauntlet, if I can put it that way, of you can't be a Democrat, you're a communist. He drew up the democratic constitution. And those who upheld 
the reactionary oppressive constitution were claiming the right to determine who could be Democrats. I have to tell you, I find it shameful that this kind of thing happened. But even more shameful is that there are still people around who rather regret that we put an end to formal apartheid and have a democratic constitution. In my time in the 1950s, <coughs> second year students, Alison, were the most reactionary, civil engineering students, were the most reactionary of all. In the 1950s, increasing apartheid was being imposed on universities, and when there were protests, civil engineering students would break up the meetings. And I would argue and say, but why do you do this? We engineers need to build infrastructure. We need to build for all our people. All of our, at that time, 20 or 30 million people, not for whites and a few million around us. And they said, but we get work from the government, we support apartheid. And they showed it then. It was quite difficult being in a minority of one in a class of originally 200, but around about 40 in later years. But I was quite fortunate, I'm a tough guy, emotionally and physically. I played rugby, which gave me a kind of status, you know. <coughs> Never made it to the first team. Damn it, I played second team, I played under 19. I did play at Newlands, and I could kick the hell out of that ball. And when you're down on the fields here and kick it, there's such an echo off the wall. Man, what a relief, what an emotional relief. And so I could sort of get by. And then you see, as you were told in the citation, I joined the Modern Youth Society, which grew out of a left-wing organization at UCT called the Modern World Society. You know, only left students talk about the world and internationalism and so on. And they wanted to meet with working class youth of all colors. And the UCT policy was only students on campus, no foreigners allowed at all. I mean, South African people, if they're not students. And to be a student here, you had to be white, essentially. And so there was the Modern Youth Society. And we had people of all colors there, of all social classes, the great and Dimba Yotoibu out of Namibia learned his politics with us. Ended up as one of the founders of SWAPO and led part of the struggle to liberation in Namibia. There was George Peake, a builder, a trade unionist, learned his politics with us. There was Albie Sachs, there were the Turoks, some of my comrades Amy and Bubbles are sitting over there now, uh, learned our politics together there. And so you see, at UCT at the time, that there were these right-wing tendencies and acceptance of instruction from government. And ma'am, Vice-Chancellor, in your first edition of uh, Alumni Magazine, you've tried to, shall I say, atone for the past of the university. Archie Mafiji, who is to be appointed a senior lecturer and on instructions from the government was denied. Of Professor, later, A.C. Jordan, who was the South African expert on Nguni language, denied a professorship and a doctorate. It's been done posthumously. Can we, can we really put it right? Or can we say, through your actions, ma'am, to accelerate the slow pace of transformation that's been happening here. You know, in prison, <coughs> I discovered that big institutions are quite difficult to turn around. It's like an oil tanker going full speed. How do you stop it? How do you turn it? And I mean getting a new head of the prison coming along, taking the microphone and saying to the prisoners, all white by the way, Good morning, gentlemen, I'm the new head of the prison. And for the whole day, the prisoners, uh, he called us gentlemen. 
He actually treated us with respect. But it didn't take, took at least 10 years for the prison guards, especially the old timers, the old sergeants, who knew better. They knew you treat prisoners harshly and would train new young warders into the bad old ways. It takes years to turn a tanker. And the University of Cape Town is a tanker. You've got a hell of a task ahead of you, man. And you've got to turn it quick because I have to tell you, just as President Ramaphosa today makes a speech in his State of the Nation address, which was a South African speech, including all the political leaders, all the political parties, not just the ANC. And you have to include everybody, all the stakeholders, in the way in which you approach this. You can't force the change, you have to lead the change. And as I said earlier, and I like the repetition as a good pedagogue, you know? I see the change happening here, but it's got to go faster. It really has to go faster. Because if it doesn't, we face the prospect that the thousand people who were murdered extrajudicially in apartheid times, even eight-year-old kids were put in prison and tens of thousands of years of imprisonment were imposed. There was imprisonment without trial and at least 140 people were hanged judicially. Can we let that disappear into nothing in the anger of our people who are getting very, very impatient. And I like it when students get impatient. I like it that Rhodes' statue is gone. I'm not sure that I like human excrement poured on statues. Seriously, I think it's a shitty form of politics. <laughs> oh, you haven't heard the word before. Really, it requires, well, it was good consciousness raising. But when I look at you all here, I want you to get your degrees. I want you from inside to change things. Not say, well, the statue's gone, it's okay now. I'll get a job. Oh, you know, I see on campus, there's the Oppenheimer building and there's the Otto Byte Students' Union. These are the great diamond magnets who exploited everything and everybody. But I also see a Chris Harney building. And I see a Stephen Biko building. And I say, what's happening at my alma mater, my sweet mother? I see nice things happening. I see the good people around. And so I'm optimistic. And I'm very happy to get the degree from this university. I really am. Because I see the change. I see the change that's happened and that my generation and me made possible. But you've got to carry it on. All of you. All of you. You've got to take up the banner and you've got to march forward. You can't go back. It can't remain at words. Change comes through action. There's a logical gap I learned at one of my sweet mothers. Oh, you know, I've got lots of them. You know, I got a second degree, and that was in prison when the security police treated me to the third degree of torture. I got it in the second grade only, because here I am. But my comrade, Luke Martin Goodle, from Cape Town, was the first to be murdered in that third degree period. I then got degrees from UNISA and, uh, and various other doctorates and what have you. So now that I've been officially capped, you'll have to call me Professor Doctor, 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 Doctor. <laughs> um, all of them have taught me. And among the great people at UCT in the 1950s, was Professor Goodlett, who was Dean of Engineering. And he took up a post in Britain in nuclear physics. 
and in his farewell address, he talked about our university, especially as the engineering faculty, producing technological barbarians. We know how to build bridges and roads and railways, and we don't care what damage we do to people. If we get an order and we get a contract, we do it. That you've honored me, an engineer, who knew how to build, and also eventually to be able to make weapons to set us free from the oppression, shows that the university understands the need to take a stand against injustice. And for that reason, I'm honored to accept the conferment of this honorary degree of Doctor of Science. Thank you very much indeed to everybody. <laughs>